It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Becky Dvorak, and we're going to be discussing her brand new book, Decrees That Heal, Prophetic Prayers and Declarations That Bring Divine Healing. Becky, it is always a joy to spend time with you. Welcome back to the show. I'm happy to be here with you. Oh, truly, truly my pleasure. I was looking back at my old notes. I always look back in the day of the interview to see when did we last talk, and it's been over two years. The audience changes, it grows. So some of the folks who listen to this and watch this, this is their very first opportunity to meet you. So we're going to have you once again share a little bit of the Becky Dvorak origin story. Uh, Give us a little insight into your background, your ministry. What are a few things we should know about you? Well, I am. I've been a missionary. My husband and I lived on the mission field for 25 years in Guatemala, where God had us raise up a children's home for boys and girls of all ages. And they came to us very sick. And many of them came off the streets, were rescued from very precarious situations, et cetera. And oftentimes they were on death door, actually. And um, it is where where God taught me how to heal the sick and and cast out demons and the whole bit. You wouldn't think you need to do that in a children's home, but you do. And prior to working in that children's home, did you and your husband have much of a grid for the supernatural or this kind of Holy Spirit driven ministry? Or did you just learn on the fly in the mission field, so to speak? Well, we were, after we became Christians, which was, I was um, 18 and he would have been 21. um, We were always in a word, a word church, a, 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 a church that taught us the word of God. And so, you know, that was, you know, like Kenneth Hagin and all of that. And so there was, there was the healing message in there. And, and I knew that healing was for today. And when I would go on uh, mission trips or things like that, um, I would pray for people and, and I would see healing come. But it wasn't until I hit the mission field and I just felt like I had 101 basic boot camp training with the Holy Spirit for all of it. And that's not an uncommon story, you know, for those of you listening or watching, if you spent time hanging out with missionaries who've come off the field or uh, you do interviews like I to do, it's, it's a pretty common story for people who they just end up in different countries and ministry circumstances far different than what they've experienced here in the States or in the West. And uh, But for a move of God, but for a move of the Spirit, that's really the only option they have. So uh, God tends to show up in ways that they maybe have never seen God's presence, His power manifest before. So on the one hand, not surprised that that. God showed up differently for you when you were on the mission field. Uh, next, I'd love to get into the story behind the book. You know, I always feel like for every author, every book is a new and a, a unique journey. Uh, what sets you down the path of writing, pulling together what became Decrees That Heal? Well, you know, I, I'm a healing evangelist, a prophetess, and I pray for people for healing all over the world. I have healing conferences and seminars. I have an online healing school. Etc., and and I'm dealing with people every single day, and and I'm teaching them how to believe for their miracle, who they are in Christ, so that they know they can believe for the promises of God, and and I'm always praying prayers of faith for people, and you know, the more you do something, you know, the the better you get at things. Um, you just learn more. And I've just learned so much about the prayers of faith. And I truly believe that people, when you ask them to pray for your loved one or whatever, people want to be able to join you in in faith. But you know what? When, in my experience, and I came, you know, since I was born again, I came from great churches that taught the word. But we weren't taught these kind of things. And, 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 and in the depth, that that I personally have had to walk in and train people in. And so this is written for, for people that want to learn how to pray effective prayers of faith 
for those that are sick, and also for those that are sick themselves, confessions of faith that they that they speak over themselves. And I have found it to be very effective. And the book is broken up into different categories of different sickness and diseases. And each one has a prayer of faith for you to pray for someone else or a confession that you speak over yourself for that specific disease. And I believe in the power of the spoken word. And, and I mean, I actually love that topic. <laughs> and, and if you go through the word of God, you see how that theme is from Genesis, the opening of Genesis, and it goes all the way through even into Revelation, where it says, Revelation twelve eleven, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the words of our testimony. And, and, and there's power. There's the power of life and death in our words. And it's something that a lot of churches don't teach their people. And so I guess God calls people like ourselves to train people in. Well, and I'll say the, the book is very actionable in terms of if you pick this up and there are specific things you want to start praying for right away, the way the book is organized, you can easily find uh, the confessions and prayers that are going to be meaningful to you. And and I, I can say as somebody who, you know, I didn't come up in any kind of a, a word environment. I, I grew up in church. We, you know, we were Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Then I married a Baptist girl and went to uh, a Baptist church for quite some time. And then, as I always say, God has a sense of humor. 10, 10 years ago, he just threw me into the deep end of the charismatic swimming pool, uh, and, and here I am. And so, you know, I, I know some of you watching and listening to this, you're, you're going to be a little bit comfortable or uncomfortable when we start talking about the power of the word and speaking things. And, um, you know, I, I don't, I, the, the more comfortable I've gotten in this space and the deeper I've gotten in this space, you know, if you're comfortable praying, you're going to be comfortable decreeing and confessing these things too. It's not all that different. Uh, than what you're used to. So don't don't get weirded out uh, by some of the words that we're using. Uh, Becky, I was excited that you share uh, a, dr a dream in the opening part of the book. I remember our last interview two years and some months ago, I really enjoyed you talking about the dreams that you know what went into that book. In this new book, you're talking about having uh, a dream about a spiritual hospital, and you, you talk about a, a spiritual nursery. I, I'd love for you to just take us into some of that dream sequence that kind of helps set the stage for some of what you cover in the book. Every time I write a book, I ask the Lord to either give me a dream or a vision or a specific word for the people. And, and he does that. And, and this time he, he, he did all of it. And, and this is a prophetic dream that he gave to me. And, and there was myself, who I say is a woman of faith, my ministry assistant, who spent 25 years in the medical field and was very disgusted by the whole thing because as a Christian, she knew what people needed and, and, and her hands were tied in the whole situation. And then, and then in the dream was my son, Marcos, who we rose from the dead and all of that. And so the three of us were walking into a very, what to me looked like a just a very run-down hospital. But as we, and, and, and we walked in, and we were just consumed by people, just totally surrounded by so many people, and they were so needy. They were just like needy and desperate, not knowing where to turn. And, and I remember we just, we all three of us just kind of dispersed amongst the it was like thousands of people in different rooms. And, and the further you got in, the worse the, the situation became. And I happened to find myself in the midst of, of a reception room. And there, and there was one nurse working the reception area. And there was just like hundreds and hundreds of people just smashed in this waiting room. And they just looked, just had no hope. I mean, the it was so disturbing to me and, and I'm offering help and, 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 and I didn't, you know, and I'm got into this situation. And I'm telling this nurse, I'm not here to cause problems. I'm here to help. And the next thing I find myself walking into a, a nursery and, and I had, you know, shortly after I'd gotten into this hospital situation, I was realizing this is not a physical hospital. This is, 
you know, the Lord is walking me through something and I walk into a spiritual nursery and there's women there that either had, were there for an abortion, um, they had just miscarried or they had just lost their, their, their vape, their child had died. Um, and, and, uh, and there was such despair and, and it was just so grievous in that room and it was just blood all over. And I'm like, you know, and then the next thing I run into my, my son in another room, the one that, and, and I say he represents the miraculous, the miracle. And, 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 and I, I, I look up and there he is in, in another room and every room is getting darker and darker. and. And I see my son over there and I'm calling him, Marcos, what are you doing? Where are you? And, and, and he goes, I'm okay, mom. They, they, they're, they're just praying for me. And I said, no, they're not. They're trying to kill you. And because they had their hands around his neck and everything. And, and to help understand that part of the dream, it was dealing with a religious spirit. And and the religious spirit is always trying to snuff out the miraculous, always. And 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 I rescued my son out of there, and then we went into a very dark, horrible, dank, you know, very damp, awfully dark room. And we were walking in there, and there was a vulnerable young man. He had Down syndrome. I don't know who he was, but it came up and he clung to me. He clung to me, and he was just holding on tight. And then walked up this really horrible, um, spiritually filthy man. And, 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 and he was just so full of sexual sins and was saying all this perverted stuff to us. And I just held on to my son and I said, we got to get out of here. We got to get out of here. And this vulnerable one, you know, looked at me and he was just leaning on me and everything. And then he was like, you know scared and then he was saying lies and everything and I said I'm not going to hurt you I'm not going to hurt you but it, it, it was just dealing with this religious spirit and and anyway I was so thankful when I woke up but I, I just laid there and I said what are you showing me God why why did you show me it was like a nightmare almost so why are you showing me this and he says this is the condition of my people right now they're hopeless. They don't know where to turn. There's such a spirit of death over everyone. And, and, and people aren't being taught. They don't know what to do. And this is the reason. And he goes, I'm showing you what's going on and the reason for it. And so that's how the book opens. Well, that is a, a, a power. I feel like a powerful expansion. Uh, I got a little bit more in the, in this interview than I got of the dream in the book. So thank you uh, for taking me a little bit deeper into that. Um, talk to us a little bit. Um, you you have a part of the book where we talk about five lies that people believe today. Um, one of them is spiritual healing is not for today. So coming out of the church context that I grew up in, we would have not prayed for healing. We wouldn't have necessarily believed. We were an anti-Holy Spirit, but we weren't believing that the Spirit was moving today. So when somebody says, I don't believe healings for to, for today, how do you respond to that? Well, First of all, I grew up in the same denomination you did, and so did my husband. So we get that. And, um, and I've had a lot of challenges from, from them as well. And I've had to deal with this, and I've had to learn how to respond to people. And number one, you know, I, I, I always go back and teach people the word. You know, God says, I have a few scriptures just written here, and and, and, and I always go, and I love to teach people Isaiah 53, 4, and 5, where, where, where it, t it tells us prophetically what Jesus came to do for us. And it does teach us that he came to heal us in spirit, you know, in right, so that our sins are forgiven in right standing with the Father, and, and that, that, he, that he desires to to heal us of our mind, in our mind and our emotions, because so much what happens there, you know, manifests in the physical body with sickness and disease. And so I teach people, you know, where it says, "By His stripes we are healed," and I take them through that, through those, to those through scriptures. And 
and teach them that, yes, Jesus did come to heal us spiritually, in the soul, meaning mind and emotions, and physically. It's all there. And nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in the New Testament, nowhere do we see that he removed that healing promise. And and so, yes, supernatural healing is for today. It is for today. There isn't anyone that can tell me. It's not God's will to heal people because it's just full the new that the New Testament is full of what Jesus did for us. Well, and you know, all you have to do is be around people who go after healing and you see people healed and you see lives change. And then it's pretty hard to 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 say that it's no longer true once you've seen firsthand the difference uh, that this can make in a person's life. And and I can say for myself, when I came into the charismatic church early on. I was looking at the fruit, you know, I would hear these testimonies and stories about lives being changed, people being healed, marriages being transformed, people freed from addictions, all these things. And when I started to get firsthand knowledge and meet people and see it happening in real time, then I was like, oh, wow, this is some amazing fruit. Like, I, I want to be around uh, where these sorts of things are happening. Uh, let, let's, let's tackle one more of the lies that you cover in that part of the book. Uh, and this is the lie of, I would, I would call it the lie of Job's friends or one of his friends at least, uh, because you are sick, you must have done something wicked, almost like you, you brought this along uh, upon yourself. God's judging you because because you did something really bad. And, and I know a lot of people feel, they get down on themselves and they feel that way. How do you respond to that lie? Well, number one, I tell them that is a lie. Jesus tells us um, in John 16, 33, he tells us, in this world, you will have tribulation. And that word tribulation means difficult times. He says, in this world, you will go through difficult times. When he walked this earth in, for 33 years, he, worked, he walked it as we do in the form of a human being. He didn't call down his God powers. He didn't cheat. He walked, he lived this earth just like you and I do. And so he understands what it's like to live in this world. He was tempted in every way in this world, yet he didn't sin, hallelujah. But, you know, he says, in this world, you will have tribulation. And yes, sin can open up the door to, to the curses. It does. But the main, the main reason people are sick today is because they're either not taught the, what, what God's word says concerning healing. They don't believe they're good enough. They don't believe God cares about their need. Um, I think of a woman, and she she had um, some type of an accident. I don't even know what kind of an accident it was, but whatever, it left her paralyzed from the waist down. And she, when I met her, was at a an outdoor healing campaign. There was thousands of people there, and they had her sitting in front of, and so when I got done teaching the word, it was now time to go pray for the people. And, and, and they brought me right to her. And as soon as I got near her, you know, there's microphones and everything. And she screams out, win, God, win. And, and, and she was angry. She was bitter because the religious community told her that this was God's will for her that she had done something wrong and she didn't know what she had done that would leave her paralyzed. She had been, you know, she was, must have been in her, her mid thirties, somewhere around there. And, and she was angry. She was in a wheelchair, could no longer walk. She had been in this situation for quite a few years now. Her dream of having a child was robbed from her. And in, and in those communities, that's very important. And, I mean, she was angry and bitter. And I knelt down by her so she could look me in the eye. And I said, number one, God didn't do this. Number two, Satan did it. He's the thief who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And that's what sickness and disease do. They steal, they kill, and destroy. And, and I said, number three, don't worry about it. Because Jesus gave me his authority over Satan and all of his wicked work. And number four, I'm declaring by faith, by the time this meeting is over, you are going to be walking out of this place on your own. 
And I went to lay hands on her and she let out this big scream and she went underneath the power of the Holy Spirit. And and then I went and prayed for all these people. And but I'm telling you, when that woman woke up from underneath the power of the spirit, she got up out of that chair, she walked. A year later, she gave birth to her first child. She had a little girl. And so but she would have remained in that sick position had she chose to hung, to hang on to that lie that she had done something wrong. God was punishing her. And, you know, and that's such a works mentality because Jesus bore the punishment for all disease, for everything, every form of the curse on his own back. And he not only bore it on his back, you know, was whipped for all sickness and disease. He transformed into the curse, all sickness, all disease, everything evil, so that we could be delivered from it. And so that is an absolute lie that God is punishing them with sickness and disease because Jesus bore the punishment for all of it. And we're just, we need to learn how to believe and how to, what we, what we say, what we don't say, how we act when we say we're believing. And you know what? The good news is you can learn that. You can learn how to believe. And I'm going to touch on uh, another part of the book where you talk about uh, lies that women specifically are taught to believe. And I, I feel like these are almost more like shame or guilt that can be thrust upon people. And, and you touch specifically on unwed mothers, people who've had an abortion, women who are on divorce, who are divorced. Uh, it, ironically, men are involved in most of these situations at some point. So I I find it, I mean, well, besides that it's unfair, I, I find it interesting that these are specific lies that are, weigh these women down and make them feel like they're so unworthy uh, to receive healing or to receive a blessing. Um, if you encounter somebody in, in a ministry line who is burdened by some of these things, how do you minister to them? How do you respond? I minister to them, first of all. I ask them if they, you know, if they have asked Jesus to be their Savior, because that's step number one. And then, then I ask them, have you ever asked God to forgive you for that? And most of them have said, yes, many times. And, and it's like, once is enough. And, and then I just lead them into a word of encouragement. And I pray over them for an inner healing. And, and sometimes I need to release people from their bitterness because they've walked in unforgiveness and that. And towards that man, usually it's what it is. And um, and I walk them through through forgiveness. Like I think of a woman that was divorced, and she was probably in her sixties, late sixties by this time, and she could no longer walk or anything. She had arthritis so bad throughout her entire body, and her friends carried her up to the front when it came time to pray for people. And I just looked at her and I just knew. And I said, are you, are you ready to forgive him? And she burst into tears. Yes, yes, yes. And I said, okay. So I walked her. It was her ex-husband. And, but she carried so much guilt and shame. And, and I never get into what, you know, all the nitty gritties. I don't need to know that, Sean. I really don't. And. You know, I'm not God. I just, I can't take that all on. <clears throat> but I led her in a prayer of forgiveness. And then I led her in a prayer of releasing her ex-husband um, from all that he had done to her and left her and, and all, you know. And I'm telling you, all that guilt and shame lifted off of her. And all the pain left her at once and she just started crying again and she's like going that's it that's all it is and I said yes yes you're forgiven and you need to forgive the people because you know if we don't forgive you know it's held against us and and I like to put it this way you're carrying that person's garbage on you you know and you don't need that you know you need to get free and, you know, the Lord says that we're to come boldly before his throne of grace, make our petitions known. But if we're carrying all this 
weight of unforgiveness, whether it's for someone else or for ourselves, we can't stand boldly before him. I mean, you know, with all that guilt. So, you know, all that guilt and shame that you talked about. And women do carry a lot of guilt and shame. They do, especially when it comes to abortions. And, but they need to know that Jesus's blood is strong enough to forgive it all. Next, Becky, I'd love to have you talk to uh, kind of, I don't know if, I don't know if uh, the balance is, is kind of the right way, right way to phrase it, but, you know, sort of that continuum of, you know, the importance of having a proper amount of expectation, like expecting being confident for a miracle and then the prayer of faith. Like what's, what's, what's the, what's that kind of, kind of balance between the right level of expectation and that prayer of faith? Is there a, a happy place to kind of land with that? There is a happy place. And I, and I teach it this way to my students. Faith, faith is trust. And the more you know God, the more you have relationship with Jesus. And and in this situation, relationship with him is healer. The more you the more you know him in this area, the stronger your faith becomes. And 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 it's that that faith is just trust, and and that trust is believing. And 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 I teach people this way: your words and your actions have to line up with. If you're saying that I'm believing God for a miracle, I tell people this way, and I've taught I've taught many, many pastors this, because I also do training around the world with pastors and that. And I've taught and I teach them what I teach everybody. When you say you're believing God for a miracle, you cannot be planning for a funeral because your actions are the proof and the pudding of what you really do believe in your heart. And out of the out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's all connected. And so if you really want to know what you're believing, look at what you're acting out. What what are your actions declaring? Are they declaring life or death? And I tell people instead of instead of planning to die, you know, making a will to die. Make a will to live. Plan. I, I tell people, get out a calendar, get out a notebook, and just start saying, this is what I'm going to do on this day. This is what we're doing today, and do it. This is what we're doing tomorrow, the next week, etc. And And make a will to live. And God always tells us we are to choose life. We choose life, no matter what. And And... And I, I, I am like, maybe, I'm not, I'm not even going to say that. I was going to say maybe I'm overboard with it, but I'm not. I believe God when he says, you know, that life is valuable, you're precious. And, and no matter what state you find your physical being in, you are valuable. You are precious to him. He cares about you. He loves you. He died. He shed his blood, not only so that you can be in right standing with Jesus, if you ask him to forgive him of your sins and receive him as savior, but he wills so much that we that we prosper in all things and be in be in health, be in good health, that he that he willingly shed his blood so that we could be healed. And so there is a fine line, there is a balance. And and when you believe. And even if you have to force yourself into it, and most of us have to force ourselves into this stuff, we do, but it's okay. You, you start speaking, you start declaring the word of the Lord, and then you start lining up your actions, tear up that will to die and all of that. I, I'm, 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 I, I, I am that way. It's like, no, we make a will to live. We live, we live every day to the fullest, to the fullest. Amen. That's Amen. what I believe. Amen. <laughs> and, and and Becky, in terms of reader's journey with the book, you know, you've you got several chapters of teaching up front, and then we get into that latter part where it's all the different uh, prayers and confessions organized, organized around different body systems, different kinds of illnesses, very, very easy to access. Uh, but, but somebody spends time with the book, they start 
praying for themselves, they start praying for others. Like, how do you hope you've impacted them? How do you hope their life and ministry has changed as they encounter and work through this material? Well, how do I hope? I hope that their faith is increased, that as they go through these short teachings in the beginning of the book and, and examine are, are there lies that, they, that they've latched onto that are hindering, you know? Um, you know, we started out this conversation by the type of church that, that you went to. And both my husband and I grew up in the same denomination. So I get it. And, and I've had to confront all of them because they're all my family and relatives and <laughs> just the whole bit. But, you know, and so I've really had to confront this issue. But my hope and desire for the reader is that I would be a source of encouragement and that they can see that God is both able and willing to heal them and to give them the supernatural or spiritual tools, which is words of faith to pray over themselves or confess over themselves, and that they would not give up and that they would continue no matter what kind of experience they experiences they have had, never give up on, on Jesus the healer. Never give up and always go for life. Life, life, life. That's what I hope. Well, and I like what you said early on that you've you've been in this kind of healing ministry for a long time, and so you've learned how to teach it. You've learned how to make it transferable to others. You know, yet w- we all have friends that we've met in our ministry circles where they'll talk about. I started praying for healing, and initially I didn't see anything happen. And they keep going after it, and they keep going after it, and then they'll have a breakthrough. And when they have that breakthrough, and they see that healing manifest before them. Then they want to go after it all the more. Or if, if like me, you start inserting yourself into charismatic meetings and circles where people are praying and you're starting to see this fruit manifest right in front of you, um, it's, a, it's a lot easier to kind of have that lifted up faith uh, for yourself to want to start going after those sorts of things. So, uh, you know, be willing to be long suffering and, and pursue it or immerse yourself in a space where this is the norm of that environment. Uh, just to be able to see what it looks like firsthand. Uh, Becky, in terms of people connecting with you, finding out more about this, other books and resources, where's the best place for us to discover you on the web? Go to my website at authorbeckydvorak.com. And we'll make it easy like we do with every episode. We'll have links in the description in the show notes to Becky's website, as well as links to where you can pick up your very own copy of her brand new book, It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Becky Dvorak. Once again, our book today was Decrees That Heal, Prophetic Prayers and Declarations That Bring Divine Healing. And Becky, I want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's always an honor and a pleasure to have you back in the show. Thank you for having me.